Who created Satan? Most people would say God. No, he didn't. God created Lucifer. God don't make no mess. Excuse me, English. God created Lucifer and create, created Lucifer. In, a, in fact, go to Ezekiel um, chapter 28 and uh, let's look at verse 12. Ezekiel 28 verse 12. He says, Son of man, take up a lamentation of the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus saith the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection. You were, uh, you, were, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. I don't know if I've ever seen perfect beauty, but look at what God did. Full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. But now look at this, Ezekiel 28, look at verse 13. He says, you were in Eden. Stop right there. You were in Eden, the garden of God. He said, Lucifer was in Eden, the garden of God. Lucifer was in Eden, the garden of God. You see, we read the Bible like, it, like it's in perfect chronological order. Our idea over the years has been, well, everything started in heaven. There was sin found in Lucifer. He got a third of the angels together, and they went against God, and they, and, and, and they lost, and God kicked him, uh, the angels, and Lucifer out, and they, they fell to the earth, and, and now they're in the Garden of Eden, and, and then God made Adam and Eve to, to see if they could overcome the temptation of Lucifer. Where did you get that from? In fact, the only place in the Bible that says anything about a third of anything is in Revelations chapter 12, verse 4. Would you go there for a moment? Revelations chapter 12 and verse 4. Because, ladies and gentlemen, we cannot allow the deceiver to keep deceiving. Yeah. Amen. If you're not careful, he will talk you out of your authority. And you'll think that he's some, some big guy like the Wizard of Oz. And then you pull the, you know, remember when, remember when Toto, the little dog, pulled the curtain back and there was this little, this little old midget back there? <laughs> Look at what he said in Revelation 12, 4. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. The dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. Is that it? Is that where they got that from? There are a couple of things wrong with this. First of all, good Bible interpretation says that you never use one scripture to determine an entire doctrine. And that's the only scripture right there that says anything about the third. And another problem with this verse of scripture is that it is so full of symbolism it would be doubly wrong to take this scripture and to allow it to create the doctrine that it's really Satan and, and, and he just, you know, look what you get out of this. You're supposed to get that out of this full of symbolism? No. I don't believe that, 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 that that's, that's how, that, how, that, how that goes. It's just, it's just too much symbolism to draw a conclusion to tell that fable that we've all heard this whole time. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you there are lots of clues in the Bible. I can prove what I'm getting ready to say, but you can't prove the fable you've been hearing. So here's what I believe what happened. We already noticed in Ezekiel 28, verse 13, that Lucifer was in the garden of God. He was in the garden of Eden. Lucifer was in the garden of Eden. And, and Lucifer was in the garden of Eden before he sinned, before sin was found in him. He was in the garden of Eden. Well, what was he doing in the garden of Eden? Well, Hebrews chapter 1, 14. I mean, what do angels do? You go back and you look at the original intent and purpose, and it'll tell you he being a part of the angelic class. In Hebrews chapter 1 and 14, he says, are, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will be heirs of salvation or inherit salvation? You've got to understand that the job here for this angel, angels are sent to minister to those who shall be heirs of salvation. And so it's easy to submit to you that Lucifer was in the Garden of Eve, Eden ministering to Adam and Eve. And isn't that just like God's nature? 
that he loves you so much and he is so good. And so what he does is he sends one of his, his best head chief angels to the, to the Garden of Eden to minister to Adam and to Eve. And boy, what a selection. This guy had pipes on the inside of him. He could make music. He could really affect the atmosphere and make it real nice in that garden. Yeah. You see, one of the things we've got to understand is that it's not in chronological order, so we have to put things together. And, and it's not like, listen, somebody says, well, God put Adam and Eve in the garden after he kicked out Satan and the third of the angels to see if they could overcome the temptation. That's just like saying, take your two-year-old and put him in the backyard where you know that there's a hungry lion out there to see if your two-year-old is going to just stand there and get ate up by the lion or is he going to call mama to come get him? That's just not part of God's nature. God's nature is love and God's nature is good. And for God to put Adam and Eve in a garden where he knew they could be deceived and knew they could be destroyed, that just goes against his nature. That's just not how he operates. And besides all of that, we've got to understand that if an angel chooses to sin and if an angel makes the choice, somebody says angels can choose. Well, let's look at 2 Peter chapter 2, I believe, and verse 4. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4. Is everybody with me on this journey? Amen. Now, notice what it says in verse 4. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, what? So angels can make a decision to sin. I said, so angels can make a decision to sin. So they can make a choice. If he spared not the angels who sinned, but he cast them down to hell. Notice, God did not create hell for you and me or for any man. He created hell as a holding cell, a prison for angels that decided to sin. And those angels were cast into hell and they were delivered. He delivered them into chains of darkness to be revealed or reserved for judgment. And so that's, that's the purpose for hell, to hold angels in jail until the time of judgment because when they sinned, they were stripped of their authority. Their authority was, was not unrestricted. Their authority was not unconditional. The, the authority that angels had, it was conditional and it was restricted. And when they decided to sin, they were stripped of their authority, sent to angel prison and held there in chains until the day of judgment. Isn't that something? But here's the question. The question is, <laughs> wow, why did Satan do what he did in the first place? What, what motivated him to do what he did? I mean, we've heard the story over and over and over again, but what motivated him to do what he did? There's got to be a motive behind it. You know, we just don't read the Bible up and say, well, you know, there's a certain serpent in the garden. He deceived Adam and Eve, and, and this is what happened. Well, so what moved him? Well, most of us, we, we've been taught that, you know, he sinned in heaven. No, the sin, the, the sin that was found in him happened in the garden. He was in the garden. It happened in the garden. Well, what was it that happened in the garden? What motivated him? i tell you what motivated him. What he saw, what he heard in Genesis chapter 1, 26, where God gave to Adam and Eve unrestricted and unconditional authority over the whole earth. Now, think about it. What, what do you think he was thinking when he heard that man had this authority? Well, go to the book of uh, Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah 14, and let's just start at verse 13. I'm going to show you exactly what he was thinking. What was he thinking about? He hears this thing about authority. He knows that angels who decide to sin will lose their authority. What's he thinking about? This whole thing is over authority. Verse 13, for you have said in your heart, so here's he talking, you're going to see exactly what he was thinking in his heart. You have said in your heart, I will, with this authority, I'll ascend into heaven. With this authority, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. With this authority, I will also sit on the, on the mount of the congregation, on the, on, on, on the farthest side of the north. With this authority, verse 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. 
with this authority, watch this, I will be like the Most High God. But we know that, that, that Lucifer was not created like the Most High God. He was created an archangel. But we also know that man was created in God's image and in God's likeness. So here's what Lucifer's thinking. If I can get man to submit his authority to me, then I can be like the Most High God because he's turning his authority over to me. Are you listening to what I'm saying? So Lucifer now goes to work. He says, I've got to deceive them into giving me that authority. Now, he recognizes that this is a big risk. God is the owner and the creator of the heavens and the earth. He says, if I go over there, he could decide to destroy the whole earth and start all over again. But how many of you know that God has exalted his word even above his name? Psalms 89, 34. He says, I've exalted my word above my name. God's not going to change his mind. He's not going to change his word. If he changes his word, if one word, if, if we change his one word, heaven and earth, the Bible says that he upholded all things by the word of his power. God is serious about keeping his word. Amen? Amen? And even though he never planned for Adam and Eve to turn their authority over to the devil, he's not going to go back on his word. So Satan's taking a chance. So, so Satan says, I'll just take a man hostage just in case God does something. And he, won't, he won't do anything to his man, so I'll just hold him hostage. So he gets the body of a serpent, one of, one of the most cunning, craftiest animals on the earth at the time. And he uses the body of a serpent, you know the story, and he goes in lying and deceiving, and guess what happens? They turn their authority over to see, because one of the things he says to them, they're talking about this deal about, you know what? If you eat of this fruit, you will be like the Most High God. See, they did not know who they were. And Satan is still using the same strategy today, attacking your identity. And if you don't learn about who you are, then he'll attack your identity because he's kept you in the dark and you will always lose. Even when Jesus showed up in the book of Matthew, chapter 4, he tried to attack Jesus' identity. If thou be the Son of God, then do this. If thou be the Son of God. But you know, Jesus knew exactly who he was. He was saying to the devil, don't, don't get it twisted. Don't let this body fool you. I know exactly who I am. I know exactly who I am. I am the Lord your God. I know exactly who I am. And look at what Jesus did. He said, I know who I am. And later he said, get. That's what you're going to have to learn how to do. You're going to start, you're going to start treating the devil like a dog. Get. Are you listening to me? And so he eases in there, and he goes after their identity. And, 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 you know, you'll be like, they were already like the Most High God. He wanted to be like the Most High God. He's got to deceive them into turning their authority over so he can be like the Most High God. Are y'all following this? And so, so they turn their authority over to the devil. Now watch what happens. God created Lucifer, but the day that man turned his authority, authority that God gave to him, authority that God gave to man, and he never intended for man to give it to Lucifer, but the day man turned his authority over to Lucifer, Lucifer became Satan. So God didn't make Lucifer, man made Lucifer. And you've got to understand something about your authority. You've got to understand how powerful you are. Yes. When you open your mouth up, you will either give authority to God for him to bless you, or you'll give authority to Satan for him to curse you. Amen. You are clothed with immense power. But the Bible says that Satan has to keep the blind blind. He doesn't want, no, want you to know who you are. And you're sitting around here, you're putting up with sickness, you're putting up with bondage, you're putting up with addictions, you're putting up with lack, you're putting up with all kinds of things. You're putting up with bad weather, you're putting up with crazy folks in the neighborhood, and the whole time you have the power to flip the switch, but you won't flip the switch. 
Turn to two people and tell them, flip the switch. Turn to two people and tell them, flip the switch. See, you won't even do what I say tell you to do. Well, I know you're not going to operate in authority. I can't even get you to turn to two people and say, flip the switch, and you think you're going to take authority over the devil. Turn to two people and tell them, flip the switch. You are powerful people, but you won't recognize it. See, God has to have your cooperation. He cannot intervene when you don't use your authority. You limit God when you don't use your authority. Think about that. The doctor tells you you have cancer, and the first thing you do, oh, God, heal me of cancer. He says, I'm for healing, but I gave you the power. You're going to have to flip the switch, baby. I told a testimony this morning at the other service how I had been praying to God uh, about, I had a, a tremendous pain in my tailbone. And I kept praying to God about it. And one day I was taking my daughter back to school and I was talking to God about how much I've been talking to him about healing, uh, healing my tailbone. And, and he said, son, you keep talking to me about your problem instead of talking to your tailbone. I've already healed your tailbone. I did that 2,000 years ago. I have already given you the power. See, when God gives you the power, then you've got to accept the responsibility. Oh, you don't hear what I'm saying. If God gives you the power to resist the devil, then you got to resist the devil. If God gives you the power to heal the sick, then you got to heal the sick. If God gives you the power to get wealth, then you got to sow a seed. That's how you flip the switch. And so I got in that room that afternoon, and I, I, I said, praise God, I'm going to take authority. So I spoke, I began to speak to my tailbone. I said, tailbone, I speak to you right now. I have authority over my physical body. I said, pain, you are no longer allowed to be on my tailbone. Now, in the name of Jesus, authorized by God, having the right to use his power, you get off my tailbone right now. I am not lying. I am not playing with you. Fifteen seconds later, man, that pain was gone. I was checking it out. I sat on, some, on a wood chair. I went and sat on an iron chair. I sat down on the concrete in the balcony. I said, Lord, have mercy. God, I'm healed. He says, you could have felt this a long time ago, but you kept, you kept trying to get me to do something that I told you to do. That's hard to believe after a while. We spent so much, so much time being seduced by religion. And most churches are not going to preach this because they don't want you to know that you're accountable. They want you to keep living life that just says, well, you know what? If the, if the devil wants to, he if God wants to heal you, then that's his will. But if you don't get healed, then that's his will too. That's wrong. God wants to heal you. In fact, God has already healed you. Healing is the will of God. Healing is a spiritual law, and you've got to have as much confidence in the law of healing as you do in the law of gravity. You don't doubt the law of gravity. If I told you to climb on top of this building and, and walk off the side, uh, you know, you, you, you would kind of hesitate because you have confidence in the law of gravity. You're, you're going to be saying in your mind, well, is gravity still working? <laughs> you don't get on top of the building talking about, well, is in five minutes gravity won't be working. No, you have, you have confidence that gravity is constant. You have confidence that gravity doesn't fluctuate. You have confidence that gravity is the same here in Chicago as it is in Atlanta, as it is in New York. You have confidence that the law of gravity works everywhere all the time for anybody that will get involved in it. And you got to have that same confidence in spiritual laws. Why? Why? Because authority is just simply making use of God's power to enforce his word. You have God's power and authority to enforce his word. 
What good is it to have authority if there's nothing to enforce? You have that word. So you have to get in that word so you can learn that word so you then can enforce it. You're not reading the Bible like a, a feel-good book. Oh, that was real nice. Has been read the book of Romans. Didn't that read just real good? <laughs> no, you're reading the Bible to discover how things are supposed to be. And once you discover that it's in the book, you now loose your authority to enforce what you just read. You're kind of like the policeman. The policeman has been given the authority to enforce the laws of the land. But what's the first thing he has to do? He's got to learn the laws of the land. Yeah. How's he going to enforce the laws of the land? You don't just give him a badge and say, go enforce the laws. He's like, oh, excuse me, boss, what's the laws? <laughs> he got to find out what the laws is. And so likewise, a Christian, even though you find out, you know, you have authority to enforce spiritual laws, you got to know that word. Amen. You got to know that God's not mad at you. You got to know he's not even in a bad mood. You got to know it's, it's not God that's putting sickness on you. You got to know it's not God that's sending you through a hard time to teach you something. You got to know the nature of God. You got to know God is good all the time, that he's full of love, that he wants good things for you. You got to know God's will for your life is that every man come to repentance and no man should ever perish. Amen. You got to know the will of God for your life. In order to be a good enforcement agent, you've got to know the word so you'll know what to enforce correctly. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Yeah. And so we sit back and we blame God or the devil for the things that are going on with us. And nobody wants to hear that. You don't want to hear it because it makes you accountable. You don't want to hear what I'm saying because it makes you accountable. It makes you accountable for your life. It makes you accountable for your finances. It makes you accountable for all of the issues. It makes you accountable. Now, I'm not saying persecution is not going to come, but when it comes, you have authority to make sure it doesn't win. But we're just kind of satisfied with, oh, well, you know, if God wants it to happen, you know, it happens. If not, then, you know, hallelujah, because you don't accept accountability for what goes on. Did I tell you a story about John Lake? I'm, you know, two services, I'm getting kind of... John Lake, John G. Lake was a powerful man of God had lost his whole family to sickness and disease. He was there that day with his last remaining uh, relative, his sister. And God got the word into him, said, you're responsible. You can overcome this kind of stuff, but you keep praying to me. John was confused. He reached out for prayer for his sister. She died, and God says, I've given you authority. If you're ever going to see the manifestations of what you know in the word, you're going to have to flip the switch. You're going to have to use your authority. He took authority even over that dead body and spoke to her and said, in the name of Jesus, I have authority over you, death. You take your hands off my sister and called her back and she lived. She's, she, she was raised from the dead. The first step in winning the war is to identify the enemy. In the Operating in the Believer's Authority Bundle, you will understand the true power God has given us. If you would recognize that this is a spiritual battle, your response will change. Operating in the Believer's Authority Bundle includes eight life-changing messages. You'll also receive the Believer's Authority Mini Book, all for a love gift of $50 or more. Don't wait. Call or go online to order today. Well, welcome to the Grace Life Conference. Now, come hell or high water, I'm the righteousness of God. No matter what happens, I am the righteousness of God. No matter what they say, I am the righteousness of God. Come from wherever you are on the planet and come to Grace Life. The devil will never come and just directly attack your belief system. He'll first of all plant a doubt. And if you would stand and reject these doubts, I believe that'll stop the progression. I mean, you know, there needs to be some grace moving into our neighborhoods and our communities and into society today. Your position in Christ is not sustained by your keeping the law of God. It's sustained by your faith in the finished works of Christ. And even though you transgress it, it does not void that agreement. Your value is not determined by the gifts, the talents, the, the abilities, or the intelligence that you have. Your value and your worth is based on the fact that you were God's idea. Register today at CreflodollarMinistries.org. See you at Grace Life 2019. Happy Mother's Day. You know, 
A mother's impact and influence is an invaluable avenue through which the love of God can be demonstrated to her children. To all of you mothers out there, I say thank you for loving your children and being a living example of the grace of God. There is a purpose for your life and you are meant to do great things. The key to reaching your destiny is to grow in your understanding of God's grace. Introducing Grace Life Academy, an innovative approach to learning God's Word. Grace Life Academy offers unlimited access with hundreds of hours of online teachings from Creflo Dollar. For one low monthly subscription, you'll have access to comprehensive video Bible lessons that include features such as e-courses, study guides, an online community, quizzes, and more. In as little as 15 minutes a day, you can study God's Word, be encouraged, and learn how to study the Bible, how to overcome fear, how to better your relationships, and so much more. And the best news, it's free for 30 days. Now is the time for you to take control of your life and join Grace Life Academy. Text GLA to 51555 to get started right now or go online to MyGraceLifeAcademy.com. Because of you, Creflo Dollar Ministries is providing a new understanding of grace and empowering change in the lives of millions of people every day. 